church. <laughs> We're doing great here this morning, you guys. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the River Community Church. Um, my name is Katie. I am a member of the church here and in charge of the children's wing at the moment. So I'm excited to have you all here to join us. Um, whether you're here in person or online, um, whether this is your first time, your thousandth time, thank you for joining us today and being a part of the service, this family. We are excited to have you here. Um, if you don't know anything about the river, um, the one thing we want you to walk away knowing is we are for you, we are not against you. You can come as you are and we will welcome you with open arms. We will praise Jesus together and get to know him better, study his word so we can grow closer to him and one another. So thank you again for being a part of this. Um, if you don't know anything about the river, if you want to get involved, um, <laughs> feel free to either fill out the contact cards in the back of the pews with your name, um, contact information, and how we can better serve you in order to get you connected. Or go ahead and reach to us reach out to us either by email or Facebook Messenger. Hello, River Community Church. Hello, everybody at home. We know that Katie is up here telling us all the great things about the river and inviting everybody to stick around and come back. But there's one announcement we have to make, and that is what? Anybody? What's the news? Katie got engaged to my dad. Hey! We've been saying that David needs to make an honest woman out of Katie for a long time. But we're so happy now that they've actually made it official. We're so happy for you guys. David is awesome, and he has a great woman, godly woman, to come alongside of him to help raise his children, who are beautiful as well. Isn't that great? And so we're so happy. So before we begin our service, we're going to pray for this couple. David, come on up. We're going to pray for them. And we will, we will pray for them, and we're going to thank God for just bringing these two folks together. And uh, let's just pray. Father, we thank you so much for this couple, Lord. We praise you for godly people falling in love. Praise you for this church and the opportunity they had to meet one another through the ministry of the river. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy, and we ask God that you would bless their lives, that you'd bless their children that you'd help them to grow together in maturity and in age and help them to grow old together and love and serve you for the rest of their lives. We love you, God, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and so let's move on to the worship, and we'll get to the service. Good morning, River Church. In case you missed it, you can watch it on the, the reruns of this morning, but we announced the engagement of Katie and David. Very excited for that family. We prayed for them, and we just asked that uh, if you want to see that announcement and you missed it or you tuned in late for any reason, please feel free to go back and watch it after the sermon is over. But please be in prayer for these folks. We love them very much, and we want them to grow in their faith and understanding and also as a couple praise god amen amen so let's uh let's begin by opening our bibles to ecclesiastes ecclesiastes all right So, one of the things we have to remember is that uh, wisdom involves making opportunities where there seemingly are none. So, there's an example that we see in California. Uh, California is bleeding companies because of its regulations and laws. This has led to thousands of companies leaving California every year. This cost the state um, over the last two years, I think, it was 300,000 jobs and $76 billion in revenue. But there are some wise, some wise executives who have used the laws and regulations to stick it to the man. And the funniest example is, of all places, McDonald's. 
This long list of regulations includes roadside advertising. So a few years ago, cute. A few years ago, we had this happen. McDonald's ordered a few bags of yellow poppy seeds and they planted the iconic McDonald's M on a hill on the side of a road. You guys can see it at home right here. Once the environmental advertisement grew, there was nothing California could do with it. Because the problem is that in California, it's illegal to dig up or touch this particular kind of poppy for any reason. So McDonald's was not allowed to do any roadside advertising. So what they did was they planted some poppy seeds in the shape of an M in a, with a seed that they couldn't uproot because of their own regulations and laws. Whether you agree with it or not, come on, that's pretty, that's pretty epic. So that is an example of wisdom. And Jesus told us to be wise like serpents. He told us to, do the, to be able to discern the wise ways to get around things and to do wise things. And wise people think outside the box. They create opportunities. They expect problems. And they diversify to minimize failure. Wise people recognize their limits, embrace the things they don't know, and they courageously make bold decisions. But the truly wisest of us know they have a creator. The wisest people know that this world is based on a blueprint, which, is, which was created by an intelligent designer. The reason why wise people can predict the future in many ways is because they can see the formula hidden inside the blueprint. They can see, the, they can connect the dots and try to put together a plan because they know it all really makes sense. So they think outside the box, which is great. And they know that we're not just some cosmic experiment. We were created in love. The wise person knows this world is good and that we are the ones corrupting it. Human beings are the ones corrupting it. So they purposefully, wise people, work and strive and struggle to create more good than evil. They constantly look for and create opportunities to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. They want the God of the universe to share this space with us, and they are looking forward to the day when he returns. But in the meantime, they know that we are fighting on the front lines against the evil of this world. They take this responsibility seriously, Scripture tells us. They look at it soberly, the author of Ecclesiastes said. They take it seriously because we're the only ones doing the job. It's in this way that every human life has purpose, infinite potential, and meaning, and today we'll be challenged to apply it because, number one, life is good. Wisdom promotes goodness. Now, this is going to be a little bit different than the rest of Ecclesiastes because the majority of Ecclesiastes is just wisdom teaching. But this is actually a poem. So if you have your Bibles open, this whole this end of this chapter here is actually a poem. That's why it's a little more it's a little more uh, uh, metaphor and, and mixed with analogies and everything. And this section is a poem, and it begins with a reference that calls back to the very beginning of time, where God separated the light from the darkness. God said life itself was good, and we must remember that wisdom is a reflection of God, so it creates, promotes, and protects goodness. We have this in Proverbs. See, life is pleasing to the eyes and sweet to the senses. The teacher said that even the simple things like sleep is sweet. And sweetness is usually a reference to honey in Scripture. That's what we get this idea of sweetness. They didn't have sugar like we do nowadays, so what you sweetened anything with was honey. And it's used in this way in and outside of Scripture, and it teaches us that life itself is something to be savored and enjoyed like honey. The sweetness of honey is used as an example because when you're talking about something that needs to be savored and enjoyed, Honey is a great example because it's rare and expensive. Similarly, the moments when you feel life is good, when you actually sit back and go, ah, life is good, are oftentimes just as rare and hard to come by as honey is. You know, most of us can't go in our backyards and just grab some honey off the honey tree. 
Honey is honey rare is and rare expensive. expensive. Honey, honey in its sweetness, sweetness is not just rare, rare it's also magical, magical to the ancient peoples. People. In Greek, Greek mythology, mythology Zeus, Zeus was raised on honey, on honey, we're told. Dionysus, Dionysus the god, god of wine, wine was, also was also raised on honey, honey which makes sense, sense because, because the, the, the earliest, earliest beer found in Egypt and in Greece was sweetened and, and made with honey. We even read that the sweetness of honey was so powerful that a person could enter the gates of hell or Hades itself safely if they were wise enough to bring some honey cakes to distract the hell beast that guards the gate to Hades. Honey is powerful in this ancient world. And sweetness and life are both good. And they were designed to be enjoyed. Praise God. This is why wisdom is so important. Wisdom is the right way to live because wisdom is for life. It's for life, not against it. Wisdom protects and produces the goodness of life. Wisdom is for goodness, contentment, happiness, and life itself because wisdom is a reflection of God's character and it's the key to our own happiness. Proverbs says this, Happy is the man who... Amen. But being wise is more than just acting in wise ways. This is very, very important for all of us to hear. Number two, you need to give yourself. Comes is futile. There are going to be difficult times. You will suffer and life will be painful at times. So this teaches us that you can't just fake it till you make it. Acting wisely doesn't mean that you can just pretend your way into happiness. Before you can pursue happiness, you have to believe that happiness is achievable. And more importantly, you have to give yourself permission to be happy. The text says, let him rejoice. Let him rejoice. This idea of letting something happen implies permission followed by action. For example, we have this, one of the earliest examples in Deuteronomy. we are commanded to give a slave permission to live as a free person. Give them permission and encourage them to accept their freedom and to live a happy life. Similarly, we are told to let ourselves rejoice because we also need permission. Interestingly, we often need someone else to give us permission in order to give ourselves permission to be happy. This is why our faith is so different from all the other religions because our God sent his son to die so that we could be forgiven and so we could forgive others and give our, and also just as importantly forgive ourselves Dr. Smee We're not going to live up to the standard of Jesus. So just by identifying with Jesus, we have to take the courage to identify with Christ because we are going to fail. This is one of the paradoxes and mysteries of our faith. We are all sinners. But the beautiful thing about salvation is that God forgives us and it has nothing to do with doing good. There is no earning salvation with our God. When Jesus died, he paid the entire penalty for your mistakes. We are truly forgiven, and this leads us to do good deeds, not out of fear of punishment, but out of pure love and gratitude because we have been forgiven. Amen. This doesn't mean that you will be punished. This doesn't mean that you will not be punished for your sins. Repentance, when we understand repentance, repentance means that you need to accept the consequences of your sin. 
This means that if you are caught stealing and repent, you must still be willing to accept the punishment as just. Real repentance means accepting the consequences of your sins as justice. Without justice, there's no real repentance. But by accepting justice, we often buy into the lie that we don't deserve to be happy. The fact is that Jesus came and died for you to be forgiven. This is not just for you to get into heaven. This is also for you to experience forgiveness today, right now, where you are, where you live, despite your past. Which means forgiving yourself so you can move past your mistakes and find that life that God has called you to live. Ephesians tells us, Paul says, we have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And if you believe in Jesus, you are forgiven. But we will still suffer the consequences of living in a fallen world. So we have been given a command to live lives of contentment and happiness despite what the world throws at us. Wise people see the truth and are, and are here to be, and we are here to be lights to this dark world. The teacher reminds us of this. The teacher says, let him remember the days of darkness so that when we reminisce and remember the past, we can encourage ourselves. We have the ability to lie and speak truth or speak truth. Remember this. We can lie to ourselves. We can convince ourselves of a lie. And we have the ability to lie or speak truth to ourselves. And it's in our memories, when we look back on the past, that we have the most potential to either look at our lives from the perspective of God's love or the world's emptiness. Again, wise people see opportunities where others see nothing. Wise people see God's love even in our suffering. If you guys are taking notes, I suggest that you get your pen or pencil ready because here are some examples of how the Bible describes suffering. First of all, when some remember suffering, they think about suffering, wise people see suffering as discipline. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons and daughters. For what child is there that a father does not discipline? If God loves you, you are being disciplined because parents who love their children discipline their children. Discipline, suffering is discipline. Where some see suffering, wise folks see the opportunity to show obedience, to show obedience. Jesus did this, says though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Obedience. When some only see struggle, the wise see suffering as an opportunity to honor God, to honor God. You will, and who will harm you if you, deep, you are deeply committed to what is good? But, even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. You're blessed to suffer. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed. Remember, fear. We're not supposed to live in lives of fear. Do not fear. Do not be disturbed. But honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to the one who asks for a reason for the hope that's in you. Always be ready to tell someone why you are a Christian, why you love the Lord. And this, oftentimes they're asking because how can you believe in God when the world is so awful? Always be ready to give a defense for why you love the Lord. Where some see weakness, wise people see suffering as strength training, as building up our spiritual muscles. Paul says, I take pleasure in, in weaknesses, and in insults, and in catastrophes, and persecutions, and in pleasures because of Christ. He's saying, I take, he says, I love this in pressures, I mean, and I love this. He's like, in persecutions, catastrophes, suffering, pressure, all for Christ. I take pleasure in these things. For when I am weak, I am strong. Anybody who's ever worked out knows the feeling that comes the probably day two after a hard workout. You get out, and it's like the first day, you're like, I feel pretty good. Day two, you wake up, and you're like, holy heck, my muscles are sore, my chest is sore, my legs are sore. Why do I do this to myself? But there's also a little bit of pride there, knowing you worked out. And every time your muscle hurts a little bit, you get that little sense of, but I did it. I did it, though. I went through it. I am now stronger than I was when I began. 
And finally, when fools only see the physical world, the wise see suffering as a path to maturity. The wise see suffering as a path to maturity. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. He's saying that his sufferings are actually helping the church to grow in maturity. My sufferings, when I suffer, I don't, it's not just suffering for my sake, it's also suffering for the sake of others. There's all sorts of suffering. Darkness in our lives can be loneliness, sadness, depression, pain, and so much more. And all of this is evil. Don't get me wrong. It is evil. It's bad. It's not good. All suffering is evil. But it's inevitable. It will happen. So you're faced with a choice today, and every single day you wake up, you're faced with this choice. You can either allow suffering to define you and be a victim for the rest of your life, blaming everybody and everything for everything that happens to you. Oh, I don't have a job because of the world. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. Oh, I'm, I'm suffering. I'm this. It's just blame, blame, blame. Or you can choose freedom. Choose to use what the devil designed for evil. Use it for good and be a conqueror. We are more than conquerors, we are told in Scripture. If you choose to be defined by your pain, you will live in fear, by definition. If you live and are defined by your pain, you will hide yourself from all your struggles to avoid the pain. If you are depressed about a relationship, you will sabotage every relationship you have because you don't want to be hurt again. If you suffer from depression, you're going to sabotage yourself. Every time somebody offers an opportunity for you to act in faith and live the life God has called you to live, you will hide yourself from your struggles to avoid pain. Avoiding suffering will be your greatest desire because your fear of pain is your sole purpose in life. And everything else will begin to feel meaningless and futile. Does that sound familiar? If you suffer from depression, that's what you start to feel like. Fear will destroy your relationships and your life. We're not called to live in fear. Our example is Jesus. He chose to use his pain for the good of humanity. And he died for this world because he believed it was good. And he believed that you were worth it. You individually were worth God coming down in the flesh and living a life and living a life and being tempted and being beaten and going through all the pain, Jesus thought you were worth that. And at the end of all of it, He still chose to die for you despite all of your nonsense and all of your sin. He had you in mind. And because of what Jesus did for you, He paid the penalty. Leads to point number three. Enjoy the present, but know, the, know your limits. Jesus died for you not just to get into heaven, but to also experience the fullness of God's love now. Rejoice, young man, while you are young, and let your heart be glad in the days of your youth, and walk in the ways of your heart, and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all of these things, God will bring you judgment. You have moved away from, we have now moved away from, you should be happy to the command to rejoice. Again, we are, the, we are commanded to give ourselves permission to be glad. Let your heart be glad. We're given permission to be glad. But there's more. You are now commanded to not just accept permission, but to begin walking in your forgiveness. To begin living as though you are forgiven. Walking always represents and putting into action what you already have decided to do in your heart. That's walking in anything. Walking in faith, walking in any kind of belief. For the Christian, this means living a life where God's will and your desires align. This is what we were saved for. Romans, we have this. Therefore, we were buried with him. We were identifying with him. Baptism is being buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. To not continue in the old way of life, to have a new life. We are saved in order that we can be freed from sin so that we could walk in a new way. 
And part of living this new life is living the way God intended, which is with full commitment and joy. This was God's intention all along. He gave us this world as a gift, and He always intended on communing with us on this earth. This meant that we should experience strength and joy. We, hear, we read in Chronicles, throughout the whole Old and New Testament, we read, splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His place. When we live in the presence of God, strength and joy are with us. To live in God's presence is to live in the ways described in the owner's manual, which is the Bible. This means honoring others, honoring yourself, and honoring your Creator by living righteously, which means to live rightly. That's all that righteousness is, is to live right. We have this, Matthew, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Observing Jesus' commands means applying his teaching to your life and to walk in his ways. If we are applying his teaching to our lives and walking in his ways, Jesus promises to be with us. This is our limit. We have the limit. That's why we have, to, we have to remember there's a judgment coming. And we've got to get this idea out of our minds that judgment is a bad thing. If you go to court and you are judged innocent, the judgment is a good thing. We can't keep looking at judgment as a bad thing. If somebody judges in your favor, it's good. And that's the point. We are going to be facing our Creator someday, and there's going to be a judgment. And for those of us who know the Lord, Jesus is going to stand there and defend us and be like, hey, I paid the penalty. For us, the judgment is good. For those who reject Christ, the judgment is bad. We are told to walk in His ways. This is why the teacher says to look for opportunities because the whole world is there for us. We are supposed to do the things Jesus said to do and not do the things he forbid. Those are our limits. This is why the teacher says, walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But no! It doesn't say believe, it doesn't say think about, it doesn't say consider, it doesn't say have the opinion of. He says, no! That for all of these things, God will bring you to judgment. God is going to look at your actions and your thoughts and your deeds and your words and God's going to look at them and weigh them on the scales of justice. You may have to suffer for the consequences for the sins you've committed. You may have to suffer and have done nothing wrong because we live in a fallen world. But the wise know there are limits. And if we live within those limits, we can be happy and, and live productive lives despite the evil in the world. This means knowing your God, knowing your purpose, knowing your gifts, and desiring only what is good. This means being content with what you have while still taking risks to grow God's kingdom. It means walking in the ways of your heart and embracing what is right in front of your eyes. Embracing and being content with what's already there, what God has already given you. It means walking in those ways and understanding what God has done. The hardest part of this whole process, though, is changing how we feel. We all need to learn to really feel. This is the hardest part of our faith. It's the hardest part for every single person who calls Jesus Lord. Learning to really feel. Remove sorrow from your heart and put away pain from your flesh because youth and the prime of life are fleeting. As we've learned, we have the ability to lie to ourselves. As studies have shown, the reason we believe lies is because we convince ourselves that it just feels right. That's how we convince ourselves of lies. We hear the same message over and over and over again, and it just feels right. Your parents, you grow up in an awful home, and you're told that you're a piece of garbage. And after a while, you're told you're a piece of garbage, and you're trash, and you're trash, and you're trash. And then you start to think to yourself, maybe I am trash, and it feels right. Because that's what you've been told. You've been sold this lie, and now you've bought into the lie yourself. It just feels right. This is the major problem we face, because we are completely corrupted by sin, and this includes our minds and our feelings. Jesus said that from the heart comes murder and strife. 
When the world tells you to follow your heart, Scripture specifically says, do not follow your heart. For this reason, without reference to God, we don't know how to really feel. Learning to really feel means learning how you really should feel in any circumstance. For example, feeling the urge to steal or having sexual desires for someone you shouldn't. These things are sins. But the world will tell you that it's natural to feel this way. But just because something feels natural doesn't mean it's right or good. Great example, cancer. Cancer happens naturally. Our bodies are corrupted by sin and, that, and it, doesn't take, it doesn't take tobacco and exposure to radiation to develop cancer. Some people develop cancer because their genes are corrupted. At the very core of who we are, we're corrupted. Some of us, it just happens and there's no rhyme or reason to it. But just because cancer can develop naturally doesn't mean that it's good. Cancer is evil, but so is envy, pride, hate, evil, sexual desires. All of those things are evil. They are the cancer that corrupts our spirit. So what did Paul say? Paul says, run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, that's what some people say. Some people, the world is going to tell you, no, no, it's not, it's not that big a deal. It doesn't hurt anybody. He says, on the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against their own body. So what did he say? He said, run because of sexual morality. Why run? Because sexual morality feels good. And it feels so right. And oftentimes we can't help ourselves. So he says, run from it to avoid the temptation altogether. We have to remember, temptations are tempting because they feel good. If temptations didn't feel good, we wouldn't be tempted. Temptations are evil. It corrupts us. It is a spiritual cancer. We're not trying to deny how we feel. We need to acknowledge it. If we are suffering from temptation, you are struggling with something, you need to acknowledge it. You need to point it out, but you need to call it sin. Just because it feels natural to you doesn't mean it's good, doesn't mean it's right. We're trying to correct. Not, we're not trying to deny how we feel. We're trying to correct how we feel. All of the evil emotions outlined in Scripture come naturally to us because we are naturally sinners. But despite how natural they feel, they are still very, very wrong. And this is part of what God is trying to teach us in the Bible. We are corrupted, and as we mature, we learn to let go of those feelings. We need to grow past such childish things and walk in maturity as adults. And when people say, well, you can't, you know, you can't change how you feel, nonsense. There was a point where you were a toddler and your emotions got so out of control that you threw yourself on the ground. If you were my children, it happened once and it never happened again. I hope that happened for you too. The thing is, is that if your parents are obeying Scripture, they would, not, they would discipline you, and they would correct your behavior. And because of your training, pretty soon the tantrum was no longer your natural response. With guidance from your parents and maturity, the new normal was not a tantrum, but rather controlling yourself. You learned to control that emotion. You learned how you should really feel in that circumstance. That is possible for all of us to still do that as adults. This is how you should really feel. And like wisdom, maturity is godly. Learning how to feel correctly. We read that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are feelings. These are feelings. There's no law against these feelings and the, the subsequent actions because they can't be wrong. They are reflections of the Spirit of God and these emotions should be cultivated because these are the reflections of our true and real selves. When you feel joy and peace and love and grace and mercy and kindness and goodness, when you feel those things, that's a reflection of who God is. But even though you may not be able to do it right now, you can really grow and mature. Yet, but you have to acknowledge that it's possible. If you believe that growth is impossible, you will not grow. 
If you do not know you, you have control over what you believe, you'll be tossed around by what he, every wind of doctrine, Scripture says. And finally, if you believe you can't change the way you feel, you'll be a slave to your emotions rather than living in the freedom God promised you. The point is the teacher's command to remove sorrow and put away pain are both possible if you focus on the truth beyond this world. The fact is that human beings are like God. We can create and destroy. The difference is, is that God always acts in accordance with his goodness and love, always. We, on the other hand, are inherently selfish. We feel pain. We often only see what's right in front of us. We don't see the world beyond. And because of this, we are short-sighted and we make mistakes. But it doesn't mean we can't try. Dr. Smeeds explained it like this. Dr. Smead said that you know, all doubt and shame and all of these things boil down to fear. And he says this, and I think I got the slide, I do, good. He says, grace is the beginning of our healing because it offers the one thing we need most, to be accepted without regard to whether we are acceptable. Grace stands for gift. It is the gift of being accepted before we become acceptable. You have permission from the God of the universe to forgive yourself, to let all of that sin and that past go and start over new today. God has given you permission to give yourself permission to forgive yourself. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did last night. It doesn't matter what you did last week. It doesn't matter what happened to you when you were a child. Every single day is an opportunity to offer your life as a sacrifice anew to the Lord of the universe. And God promises that if you do this, you are forgiven. You could start over. You can be happy. You can find contentment and joy and peace because His grace is real. You can't measure grace, but you can't measure love either. And people say, oh, well, where is God? You can't see Him or, or measure Him. You can't measure love. But we know love exists. We know love is just as real despite the fact I can't see it, touch it, or taste it but your acceptance is just as is real. So the question is for you, every single one of us have stuff to work on. What do you need to work on right now? What are you struggling with right now? And then give yourself permission to forgive yourself for the past and start new today. You do not have to be defined by your failures or your pain. You don't have to walk around and say, I'm an addict. I don't have to walk around and say I'm an alcoholic. You don't have to walk around and say all these different things. And those might be true. And it's good to acknowledge those mistakes, to acknowledge those things, but they don't define you. You are a child of God first, and then a sinner second. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. You are so good to us. We pray, God, for forgiveness. And Lord, give us the courage to boldly, with your wisdom, to forgive ourselves. Help us to see not just the right actions, but help us to see the right feelings and the right thoughts that begin the actions that you called us to live. Help us, Lord. Just help us. We cannot do it on our own. We need your guidance and your grace, and we accept your truth. Lord, help us to look beyond the surface and not see jerks and people and sinners and all these different people we don't want to be around. Help us to see a world of lost people just as lost as we are. Help us to take Your mercy and give that mercy to others. Please, Lord, fill our cup until it overflows so we can give it to others and spread Your love. We praise you, God, for the opportunity and the courage to live a life of faith. In Jesus' name.